So I would like to start this morning with an interesting exercise. Actually going to ask you to be uh, participators this morning, right? But in technologically cool ways. Are you ready for this? Um, We have here at the church, you may not know it, but a secret bat phone. It's a secret bat phone. Uh, Just letting you know, uh, it makes its way around the church. It is the secret bat phone of Covenant Church. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to text that bat phone by texting in the text line, office at covenantsharon.org. I was going to give you my cell number. Some of you have it. If you want to use it, you can. But there is this thing called the World Wide Web, and uh, it's a little uncomfortable giving my cell phone out to the world, right? Um, So we're going to ask you to text. Get your phones out. So this is this is active participation, right? Text office at covenant share. And here's what I want you to text. The answer to this question. What does a growing covenant church look like? Now you're texting. I'm not asking for an encyclopedia response, right? So, so what, what is it that a growing covenant church looks like? A statement that you hope will be true of covenant church in Three to five years, seven years, ten years. What does a growing covenant church look like? And if you're not a part of covenant church and you're watching online today, then even just think about your church that you typically go to or to the larger church, the church. And, and, and what should the church look like in the next three to five years? So we're, we're dreaming together, right? Thinking together about what the church should be and we, what, we want our church to look like as a movement of God. Now, I know that's a lot to ask for you, uh, ask, uh, ask of you on the fly, so uh, I'm going to run through some things that I often think about and pray for regarding Covenant Church in the next three to five years, and, and you are allowed to steal one of mine, that's okay, or, or maybe it spurs something on, or maybe you're just going to completely ignore me as you write your own. All of those are good options, right? All right, so this is what I want you to, so you're, you're texting, I see many of you heads down, thumbs going, that's, that's good, but here, here are five of mine that I regularly think of that, that I pray for, for us as a church. What does a growing covenant church look like? Uh, a growing covenant church looks like a people who are on mission in all of life, right? Who are on mission in all of life, that it's not just about Sunday morning, Um, that we come together and do this thing called church, but that we are the church and on mission in all of life. Secondly, a a people who are hungry for the next spiritual truth and a church that can effectively move people through the stages of spiritual growth, right? So we work really hard here at Covenant Church thinking about how we can help you walk in this journey called spiritual growth or spiritual formation. But it takes people who are hungry for the next spiritual truth to fit into that pattern. So I pray that regularly for you and for us. Thirdly, uh, I, what's a growing covenant church looks like? It's a people that love to celebrate our God together. That We expect and anticipate that coming here on a Sunday morning to worship him together as his people is a celebration and a time in which we love to do together. Uh, fourthly, Uh, Being a family that loves to strengthen families. I dream and pray for the day when, again, Covenant Church is filled with young families and that we, as of all ages, can minister to young families and be a family that strengthens families. And finally, uh, fifthly, uh, if you're stealing any of my ideas, this is a good one as well. Uh, A growing Covenant Church is being a body of believers that reflects our city. If you took a cross-section of Sharon, and, and looked at what that looked like, that we on a Sunday morning would look that way, right? Whether that's ethnically, racially, socioeconomically, all of those things, that we would, because we sit, you do realize this, in the middle of Sharon, right? That we would reflect what our city looks like. So a growing covenant church is, is looking like that for me for those five things. You, you, you got yours down? Sent it to me? Because I'm actually going to read them during the last hymn and uh, report on some of your brilliance. All right? All right? So, so, so here we go. Now, that's a very fascinating topic. And there's a lot of me, right, that would love to stop now and take the secret bat phone, right, and just begin to read them and begin to unpack those. And we would spend the next three to seven hours uh, figuring that out, right? But that's not the purpose of the sermon this morning. That's not a bad project to take on as you text me all these wonderful things. Uh, It's not the point of this morning. So uh, I ask you this question, and and I'm very interested in your responses because the historian that writes 2 Kings 
And the story of Elisha that we've been uh, thinking about since January tells a really, really strange story at the beginning of chapter 6. And as strange as it is, I think the point of the story is to tell of a growing movement in the church in Elisha's day. And then I think to share three really important keys to that growing movement. So we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bibles, turn there, or on those cool electronic devices that you already have out, you can find it in there someplace. Um, and, 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 and we're going to read from that for just a second. But let me come back and, and make sure that we're grounded in our memory verse, because I think our memory verse has a lot to do with the reality of where we go today. But our memory verse in this series has been not from 2 Kings, but actually from Revelation, Revelation 21.5. And if you would... Uh, like to, if you would love to, if you want to celebrate and worship in reading God's word together, then uh, maybe from memory, or you can cheat because it's on the screen, let's read together Revelation 21, 5. Ready? And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and True. Listen carefully to our text this morning to hear the new things that God is doing. And let's think together about the new things he is doing in our lives as well. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now, the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. So let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And Elisha answered, go. Then one of them said, be pleased to go with your servants. And Elisha answered, I will go. He was a man of few words. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. That's a weird story. Right? There's a reason that you never hear anybody preach this text unless they're walking through 2 Kings in the life of Elisha, right? Because this is one that jumps out at you and goes, man, this is going to be good, right? But it's here. And I want us to see it in all of its glory because I think there's some amazing things to behold in God's word as always. I first want you to see in that text that there is a growing movement of God. There is a growing movement of God. Uh, We need a flashback in order to see this in its entirety, right? So uh, back to 1 Kings 19. You don't have to turn there unless you like to. But in 1 Kings 19, uh, the very first message that we shared in Elisha, we were in 1 Kings 19. It is a time in which Elijah, not Elisha, is the leading prophet in Israel. And he serves alongside a very evil king. His name is Ahab. And Ahab had an even more evil wife. Her name was Jezebel. It's a rough time to be a prophet of God in 1 Kings 19 when easily the majority worship Baal as their God and not Jehovah God. The one true God is angry at his people and he's bringing judgment on them and he's using Elijah to communicate that judgment. In the midst of that, God does some amazing miracles through Elijah. Uh, The greatest being uh, defeating the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18, kind of a really cool God showdown. If you've not read that story, that's a great story you want to read in 1 Kings 18. But as we turn to 1 Kings 19, even though God is doing all of these things, we find Elijah running from this evil Jezebel who wants to kill him. (laughs) And in 19, we find him very much alone. In fact, twice in 1 Kings 19, Elijah says, I 
even I am the only one left. He was isolated, alone, by himself, in a place of despair and devastation. And yet it's in that place that God shows up. And he tells Elijah that a day is coming that he will see, you ready for this, 7,000 in Israel whose all of their knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him, right? So at the very end of 1 Kings 19, in the midst of his devastation, God shows up and he makes him a promise. I know you feel all alone. But there is a day that is coming when there will be 7,000 who have never even bowed to Baal, let alone change their mind from Baal by virtue of the power of God. And it gave Elijah hope. And in that hope, he found God promising him a growing Movement. Now, turn to our text in 2 Kings 6. Elijah has been taken up to heaven. Elisha has stepped into his role. This is the story we've been telling. And with a double portion, is now doing amazing miracles to show that God is a God who makes all things new. That's the purpose of Elisha, why we are studying him in such a day as this. And as Elisha is visiting one of the several schools of prophets... A school, listen, here in, in uh, 2 Kings 6, a, a, a school that would have, in Elijah's day, had little to none in its school, right? So picture, I don't know, seminary, prophet school, right, uh, in, in the reality of this. But it's really a picture of the church. And, and in Elijah's day, Elijah's feeling all alone because if there is anybody in these school of prophets, they're hiding out in caves, like literally hiding out in caves because they fear for their lives. But in 2 Kings 6, did you hear what's happening? Like, you should get excited about this. In 2 Kings 6, Elisha visits this one, probably one near the Jordan River, right? And one of the prophets comes to him and excitedly says, Elisha, there ain't enough room for all of us. Like, we're growing. Like, there's more coming to learn about Jehovah God. And this space, we're not only not in our caves, but in this place that God has given us, it's too small. There is, listen, I want you, we can easily flip by it. I want you to see that the promise of 1 Kings 19 is coming true. And Elisha is getting to see it. There is a growing movement of God. It's not unlike a movement that some of you have seen in this very place. Some of you back in wonderful Jack Chisholm days were packed like sardines in that old sanctuary, right? Sitting on the mezzanine in, in, in overflow growth. And the reality of this church is thriving and, and all that. And, and, and you were like, there ain't enough room. So let's build, I don't know, this place, right? And if, if, my, if my historians tell me, true, you, you actually went and got the largest beam ever brought to Sharon, right? And, and landed it right across here. As you built some of you, I'm looking at some of you that I know, with your very own hands began to work on this sanctuary. You understand, right? What a growing movement of God is. But it's been some time since we said at Covenant Church, there ain't enough room here. <laughs> there just ain't enough room. And so we dream, right? We dream of a movement of God in Sharon, a movement of God in these walls for his glory, that indeed we might have such a problem again. Revival and renewal of his people. With me? How exciting is that thought? How badly do we want to see this kind of movement here at Covenant? So how do we get there? How do we get to not only a numerically growing movement that has value, but even more value to a spiritually growing movement of God? And that is a great question. So no better place to look at how you get there to a place where one is happening. In 2 Kings... Chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I don't think the historian wrote it as a church growth principle, 
But he does note that the church is growing. And I, I want us to see three principles this morning in the story that might answer our question of how. That we might see some of the things that you have already texted to me this morning. Seeing things here that enhance the rapid growth of the school of prophets. And the first of that is this principle. It demands everyone do something. It sounds pretty simple, right? The church is lousy at this. It demands that everyone do something. I, I love the heart of this prophet. Elisha comes to visit the school of prophets, and here comes this prophet who says, listen, we need a bigger place. So how about everyone go cut down a tree and let's build a place? That should elicit all kinds of questions in your mind, right? Like, is that, is that really a good idea? But I want you to hear his heart. Nobody's left out. Give everybody an ax. Let's go to the Jordan River. Let's cut down a tree. And let's build someplace bigger. Because everyone is demanded to do something. Maybe to hear the beauty of this suggestion, consider the alternative. Elisha, I think we need a bigger place. Why don't you go do a study to find the best contractor in all of Israel to come in and build the place for us. And we'll sit here and watch. That would be an alternative approach. It's not the approach that he took. Now, there are a lot of reasons that we don't do actual building projects <laughs> like this today. You don't want me building anything, right, that you ever want to step foot into. Uh, but it highlights a beautiful principle of not necessarily building a building for God, but a movement for God. Because I will tell you, in the movement for God, it demands everyone do something. That building a movement of God in his church cannot be, cannot be a spectator sports. Reminds me of a story. Once upon a time, there were four men. Their names were everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. But everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Quite frankly, anybody, even he could have done it. But nobody did it. Somebody got angry about it because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it. Nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody, and nobody did the job that anybody could have done in the first place. Now, you're, you're smiling and, and nodding your heads because you're thinking one of two things. This is my church, or this is my workplace, I'm going to text Rick this week, not with an idea, but I want that story to hang in my office. Right? Do you get it? How, how sad is that? But how true is it? So I ask myself and us, what excuses have we made for not doing our part, of not cutting down our tree? Did, did you notice how unprepared the school of prophets were in our text? How inexperienced they were? The one guy is swinging an axe, and the axe head flies off, and he's deeply concerned. Why is he deeply concerned? It was borrowed. Listen, the dude that you had cutting down a tree didn't even own an axe. That's inexperience. That's unprepared. And he could have made the excuse, sorry, Elijah, don't own an axe. But he didn't. He found one. And he borrowed, and he obviously didn't know how to use it. They had every excuse not to do their part, but they didn't. And in the same way, we try to find every excuse in the book not to do ours, but we shouldn't. It seemed like an appropriate day to tell you a granddaughter story. So Grace, whom most of you have met, she runs around here after church every once in a while. Four going on 13, 20, going on five in May. Uh, this week, uh, walked into her neighbor's house with her mom 
and as she walked into her neighbor's house, noticed that they had an Alexa. And so Grace, who is relatively bold, walked over to the Alexa and said, play Jesus Loves Me. And in her neighbor's house, she led the chorus with Alexa of Jesus Loves Me. Was she told to do that? No. Did she go through an eight-step evangelism explosion class in order to be prepared to do that? No. What was important to her, what was valuable to her, is what came out. Listen, if a four-year-old gets this, how about her 50-something-year-old grandfather? How about you? This movement of God demands that everyone do something. Secondly, it requires that leaders are to go with you. Look at the text. The prophet says, we are all going to the Jordan to cut down a tree. Elisha says, go, but it doesn't stop there. Another prophet speaks up and says, Elisha, be pleased to go with your servants. And Elisha says, I will go. Notice the obvious, how easy it would have been for Elisha, this miracle worker, this prophet of God, this leader in the church, to elevate himself as that prophet, as the guy that God is calling out to do miracles through, as the head honcho, and that in a building project, he might be more of a supervisor than a participant. But that's not what he does. He positions himself as a servant leader. As a leader that goes to be with his people. Uh, the overwhelming image of the Bible for leaders is a shepherd. God gives us his example as a shepherd in the 23rd Psalm. You know it, right? Great words that we should say together. If you feel like saying them out loud, it's always good to read the word of God together, right? This is one that we know and that we love. And it is this supreme example of God giving us an example of what it means to be a shepherd. I'm going to take... Uh, all kinds of discipline to not preach on it, simply have us read it, right? I think you'll get it, right? So say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ah, I hear it. A leader, a shepherd that is with his people. Listen, uh, we, we can keep going. He, it, God actually disciplines poor leadership in Israel in Ezekiel 34 through the image of, guess what? A shepherd. Don't say this one with me. It can get a little depressing. You ready? The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, oh, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. You the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. 
go to the New Testament, in John 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Why? Because I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he gets out of town. That's my version, right? He leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In fact, Jesus goes on in this text to say, no one will snatch my sheep out of my hand. That's a good shepherd. Peter experienced the shepherding care of Jesus after his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, in restoring Peter as an apostle And he does it with a shepherding message. Three times, what does Jesus tell Peter? Feed my sheep. And it leads Peter to write in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, these words. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be Revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You hear it? And we're just getting started. The shepherd is called to know his sheep, to lead his sheep, to protect his sheep, to feed his sheep. And it all comes from what? Being with his sheep. It's exactly what Elisha is doing in our text. And it is what we are called to do as leaders in the church. To which some of you are saying, well, shouldn't you reserve this part of the sermon for an elders meeting? Maybe a deacons meeting. Maybe a small group leaders meeting. Maybe a youth leaders meeting. I have good news for you. They've all heard this, right? (laughs) <laughs> and they're hearing it again with accountability to all of you that knows that they've heard it. And I have to add, that you have some amazing servant leaders in this church in those places. Just this past week, your elders went through the entire role of the church at our session meeting. And we all took assignments to being your under-shepherds. To being the ones who want to care for you. But listen, I don't think it's just the professional shepherds, the elders, the deacons, the small group leaders, the youth group leaders. I I really believe that if you don't have someone in your life that you are shepherding in some way, that you are leading in some way, in some spiritual journey or life journey, then you've missed the first point. So let me go back. The movement of God demands what? That everyone do something that will include at some level being a shepherd, being a leader to someone else in your life. So yes, there are appointed shepherds to this body who need to work hard as such, and they do. But may, the own, may they only be a part of the shepherding that happens in this movement of God at Covenant Church. And may we all, as shepherds, be with our sheep to serve our sheep as Elisha was. With me so far? One more thought. And maybe the most important of all, not only does everyone have to do something, and that requires leaders to go with the sheep, but we are all dependent on God to do the miracle. (laughs) As much as God calls us to be involved and to lead in his movement, literally, listen, literally nothing can happen unless God is doing the miracle. So, so the, the prophet movement is happening in Elisha's day because they are seeing God at work in the miracles of Elisha. And they're saying, man, I want to join that movement. Who wouldn't, right? Like dead people coming to life and the reality of those with leprosy being healed, right? I, I, 
I'm with that crew, right? Positive peer pressure. That's a movement I want to be on. And that's happening. But it's only happening because God is making it happen. And this whole axe head thing, is it not a picture of it? An inexperienced prophet is chopping down a tree with a borrowed axe, and the axe head flies off. I want to point out one miracle that's not mentioned in the text. No one died. Right? Which literally is a miracle, because if you read Deuteronomy 19.5, the the law gives provision for someone who dies of an axe head flying off the handle. It really does. So, like, it must have happened. So I'm, I'm sort of not joking. Like, it's, it's a miracle that this thing flies into the Jordan River and not into somebody's uh, portion of their body. Some kid's going to draw a picture of that. <laughs> Nuts. Uh, instead, the axe head goes into the Jordan River. The prophet is more than a little concerned because it's a borrowed axe, so he calls Elisha over. And this is where my mind goes weird. You're used to this, right? But I'm wondering... What is this prophet expecting Elisha to do? Right? So, what was it? Hey, Elisha, come over here. Like, the river's running a little hard today, but God's with you. Why don't you go in and get my axe head? Or, or, or maybe, maybe this prophet was near the Jordan River at the very beginning when Elisha took the cloak of Elijah, right? Remember this? And he hit the Jordan River, and the Jordan River split. He's like, that'd be cool to see you again. And listen, I won't even get my sandals wet when I go in to pick up the axe head. Can I tell you what nobody was expecting? For Elisha to cut off a piece of a tree, throw it in the river, and for the axe head to float. Wasn't even close to anything anyone expected. And you know why? Because God said, I'm doing this thing. Quite frankly, right? If Elisha comes over, he wades in and gets it. Everybody goes, Elisha, you're the dude. If Elisha takes the jacket and hits the river in the river's parts, you go, man, that is so cool. I can't wait till you do that again. But when Elisha takes a piece of a stick and throws it in the water and the axe head floats, you're going, dude, like, how'd you? You didn't do that. (laughs) No, I didn't do it. God did it. God did this thing. Just like God's doing this thing of growing his movement in our people. (laughs) So listen, if the pastor's good at talking to people about Jesus and we see a movement of God, what will we do? Uh, Sometimes we'll just keep bringing people to church and go, hey, listen to that dude. Eh. We'll keep depending on the pastor to talk to people about Jesus. We might even just bring them to church and say, hey, listen. But we will often begin to focus on whom? The pastor and not God. (laughs) Quite frankly, sometimes the pastor starts relying on the pastor and not God because everybody likes him. But it ain't the pastor that's leading people to Jesus. It's God. And here's the good news God is able to switch it up, ready for this, and actually have you, yeah, even you, be the one that lives out Jesus, that speaks about Jesus, and sees a miracle in bringing that person into a relationship with him. He's just likely to take a stick from a tree, throw it into the river, and do a miracle. The commentators are a little fun to read on this text. The preachers are a little interesting to listen to. They, they will make much of the stick as the cross of Jesus that brings us up from the depths of the river and give us new life. I heard a preacher this week, I won't name him. And he said, you lost your job? Blah, 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 goes the axe head. You lost a relationship? Blah, 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 goes the axe head. You lost your dog? I don't think he said dog, but blah, 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 goes the axe head. But listen, Jesus, Jesus will be the only one that brings, you might catch on to who this might have been by virtue of the accent, right? Jesus will be the brand. Listen, that's good stuff. 
I, I, I only make half fun of them. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's the point. It's not that Jesus can. I think the historian's point is that only Jesus will. Jesus isn't a multiple choice option here. He's the only one. That's what he's communicating to the school prophets. The movement that you see is not because of Elisha. It's not because of you. It's all because of God. The opening chapters of 1 Corinthians preach well here. So uh, listen, listen to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. (laughs) I love this verse. It makes me feel so good, right? But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. God chose a stick, he doesn't write this in, but God chose a stick in the Jordan to raise an axe head so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom. This is not the next slide, is it? God chose what is love. Maybe it is. Sorry. And because, thanks, Chris, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. It is righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let no one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. A little later in that text, right, in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul goes on. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They're servants through whom you believe. It's the Lord assigned to each. I, says Paul, planted Apollos, watered. But what? God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So, so maybe this morning as we close, hear the sermon in reverse. It is God who saves, point number one. So leaders, shepherds, feel confident as you go that God is up to something. And he's up to something through you. And all of you, God is not asking you all to do something because he needs you to, but because he's chosen you to. He doesn't want you to weirdly freak out with the word evangelism. He wants to amazingly freak you out with how he intends to use you for his movement in the church and in this valley. You didn't know it was a trick, right? That when you texted the Batmobile that you would be responsible to be the one that goes and does it, to be the leaders that lead the people. But I hope you know that no matter how successful we are with any of those things, that it will be God that does it in our midst. And we get to have fun doing what he has planned before the foundations of the earth. So some questions. What are you doing for the movement of God at Covenant Church? How are you shepherding others in the movement of God in your life? And if you're stalled, are you stalled out of fear of failure, of feeling unequipped? I have good news. You are not responsible for saving anyone any more than Elisha was responsible for raising an axe head. But we are responsible for cutting the stick and throwing it in the water and trusting that God is going to do his thing. What does a movement of God look like at Covenant Church? It's a whole mess of messy people. A whole mess of messy people doing their part, active as shepherds, and watching God do miracles in our midst. By the way, Easter is upon us. Do you really think anyone would be surprised if they caught you talking in the next weeks about Jesus? 
Heck, it's Easter. We, we are going to take a break on Sunday mornings from Elisha for the next three weeks, but not take a break from Revelation 21.5. And the fact that God is always doing a new thing. So here it is, Easter 2021. God is doing a new thing. We will be jumping out of the book of 2 Kings and into the book of Revelation to look at the Easter story. And listen, everybody likes some good God conversation out of the coolness of the book of Revelation. I mean, just go to work and say, listen, next three weeks my pastor's going to be talking about Easter from the book of Revelation in the end times. (laughs) It probably won't be nearly as exciting as what's rolling through their head, but it'll be good, right? So find someone in your life who's not going to church anywhere. Lean in to find out what they think about Easter and the end times and invite them to come celebrate with us at Covenant Church. And let's watch together God doing what he promised. Just like he did for Elijah when he said there'll be 7,000 who don't bow their knee to Baal but only to God Jehovah. Maybe the very things that we found today are the things that God is about doing in our midst. But here's the good news. Not only is he going to do it, but he's going to do it through you. How great is that God?